We will start out with Ryan uh, Newhoffel. So Ryan's going to talk to us about the big picture today. He's going to talk about the detail and the appeal and the rapid growth of direct primary care. First of all, Lee, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, whenever uh, Lee asked me to speak, he kind of gave me a, 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 an agenda here, and it was to detail the appeal and rapid growth of direct primary care. And, and my first thought... Um, was appeal, well, no, duh, that's going to be like a 10-second presentation. And then rapid growth was, well, it depends on when you started this journey. Um, I started a little while ago. Um, I have a direct primary care practice in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, my name is Ryan. Um, I started in December of 2011, but have been thinking about direct primary care for a few years before that. So um, I'll get started here. How do I go? Where's my, uh, is there a clicker here or something here? Is that it? Okay, cool. Um, so, so I only have 20 minutes here, so I can't start at the beginning of time. But what I'll do is kind of tell you about um, my um, journey um, and my story um, in discovering direct primary care and building a practice. And um, since I started pretty early on, I think that will um, encompass most of the um, direct primary care story. Um, so this is me. Uh, oh, sorry, I have two things going on here. Um, <coughs> This is me when I had more hair, and I believe I was an MS two or three when this picture was taken. Um, so I went to undergrad um, and, and really didn't have any idea of what I wanted to do. Um, I was a geek and liked uh, biology, but uh, didn't really envision myself in healthcare. Um, didn't do so good the first uh, semester or two in college, and my, um, my advisor said, well, you have to figure out what you're going to do or you're not going to finish college. So she convinced me to do a shadowing program, a primary care shadowing program through a, a med school, and I got matched up with a, um, a doctor near my, my hometown, and he was the quintessential country doctor. Um, his name was Dr. Voorhees. Um, he was semi-retired in his 70s, owned a farm, and, and saw patients maybe 20 or 30 hours a week. Uh, but he would often come in in the morning with um, cow stuff on his boots um, and take care of patients. Um, and he had such an amazing relationship and an, and an amazing practice. And um, because I didn't really come from any healthcare backgrounds um, other than occasionally getting hurt and needing an orthopedic surgeon when I was younger, um, I thought that was what medicine was like. <laughs> um, and so I made my decision to become a doctor after shadowing this amazing doctor for a whole summer and thought, yes, that's what I wanted to do. So I went back to my advisor when the school year restarted and said, yes, I want to be a doctor. And she said, well, you're going to have to get straight A's from here on out because you've, you have to make up for lost time. Um, so I did that um, and got into medical school. And then for two years, like much of you, um, I studied, took tests, studied, took tests, studied, test, test, study, study. Um, but I was very eager to get to the real world and start caring for patients like I'd saw Dr. Voorhees do. Um, but um, <clears throat> what I ran into was paperwork, uh, paperwork, uh, an occasional patient paperwork, um, and that's what I saw most of the, uh, uh, my mentors doing, uh, the residents doing, and, and all the doctors who I was working under, uh, and I found a lot of really burnout doctors. Um, and I, I was a student who asked a lot of annoying questions, like why. Um, I was very naive, admittedly, and, and then became kind of disillusioned with, um, with what I was seeing. I still wanted to be a family doctor by the time I, I graduated medical school, but uh, I just didn't know how to do that. <laughs> Um, so here's me. Somehow I, I grew younger um, uh, there. I don't, yeah. Uh, again, so I, I had lots of conversations with uh, doctors and, and um, uh, usually older and wiser than me about how to fix all of this. Um, and, you know, that usually revolve political discussions and other things. Um, but uh, I, I just really didn't have much hope in those. Um, I, I'd seen doctors, um, you know, two or three generations of doctors promise uh, fixes, but nothing came to fruition. Um, I think the very first time I, I read about the concept of direct primary care was in 2006 or seven. I read about Garrison Bliss as he was starting Seattle, uh, out in Seattle starting Q Alliance. Um, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. This is, this is the future. This is, you know, by the time I graduate residency, this is I'm going to be able to do this. Um, but I, I, I introduced that concept to people, and most people scratched their heads and, 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 and would almost refuse to talk to me about the topic. Um, the first person I ever talked to is actually setting up on this stage right here, Josh Umber. Um, I was a fourth-year med student. Josh was an intern uh, in Wichita. And I remember Josh and I being on OB call um, and talking about this concept. And I, I don't know if the phrase direct primary care was still being used. Probably not. Um, I think I was trying to convince Josh to use the phrase, maybe. Is that how it went? Probably so, yeah. Um, and so Josh knew he wanted to do something different. Uh, and I remember all the senior residents in the room were looking at Josh like he was crazy. And I was a student, so I was even more crazy. Um, so, you know, I, I, I put, my, put my nose down, finished um, um, med school and started residency. I, I uh, ended up in Arizona for residency. And I 
you know, like much of, uh, much of youth route residency, I, I mostly did clicking and clicking, um, occasionally saw a patient, um, checked my pager, slept a little bit, um, but I, I continued to watch uh, uh, Q Lyons and, and uh, a few other people, and then Josh had started his practice, um, you know, a year, about, year before I did. Um, but I, I kind of came to the conclusion towards the end of residency, I had to do something. <laughs> um, I didn't see myself working any, in any other way. Um, I watched the debate about the ACA unfold. Um, you know, there were some aspects of that I thought might be positive, but I didn't think it was going to fix the real problems. Um, and uh, I, I remember telling people uh, in my residency what I was going to do. And uh, I mean, they were, they were just absolutely baffled at why I would want to do such a thing. Um, but I, I was kind of determined to do that. So I graduated uh, in July of 2011. Uh, I had a, not that many examples to, to follow. Um, so I really started with a, a blank slate in my practice and took a leap of faith um, and started new care in, in December of 2011. So the first few years were hard. Um, another picture of me. <laughs> Um, this is, this is in December in Kansas. Um, uh, so, um, I, I would say when I first started, um, it, depending on how you use the definition, there was a few dozen at most, uh, direct primary care practices that, that were open in 2011, but there was virtually zero awareness. Um, uh, people didn't, uh, uh, understand what I was doing. Um, I started in, in a new town after residency straight out with zero patients. Um, I pulled lots of stunts. You guys have probably seen some of them on the internet. Um, but I pounded the pavement and went and talked to every single person who had listened to me. Um, and I had steady growth, um, but I made adjustments along the way changed um, the way that we did a lot of things because, again, I was starting with a blank slate. I watched some of my colleagues, um, met, met uh, uh, um, several colleagues who, who joined the fray um, later on. Um, and kind of in that process, um, I learned to love medicine and be a doctor for the first time. Um, so the, the thing that kind of uh, probably still strikes me is that I didn't, I didn't realize what being a doctor would be like until I had my practice. Um, so there... there um, was um, a lot of uh, hard work, um, but I, in that process, uh, although I was uh, scared to death starting a practice, um, and it's, it's definitely not for the faint of heart, um, I, I kind of in the midst of that uh, realized that I had done the right thing. Um, and I met so many amazing people um, along the way, um, and many of them are here today, and I um, couldn't have done it without them for sure. Um, so then, eventually, after I got through the long, cold, hard winter, um, probably in 2014, I would say, a lot of groups started taking notice. Um, and uh, that was great in some respects, but I um, was also very frustrated and thought, where the heck have you guys all been? Um, so um, uh, obviously, some organizations now are, are supporting us. Um, and I think this slide, if you guys, or this um, comic, if you've never seen it, I think encapsulates any type of social movement. Um, and I think, I don't know which part of this we're in. I still think we have people yelling at us and some people saying they get it and some people coming to our side. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I have felt about this, this journey. Um, I would say early on, um, I, I, I rarely got <laughs> uh, uh, interest in, in the first couple years in practice. Um, but, you know, I occasionally get an email or call from a doctor saying, I want to do this. And I was so excited every single time I got an email that, oh my gosh, someone gets what I'm doing. And I was talking to them for four hours, any person who ever wanted to talk to me. Um, but there, those, those uh, you know, first few dozen people who I, who I met who started practices um, um, uh, provided me so much uh, moral support and sharing of ideas. Um, and it was a pretty, you know, tight-knit group. And I, I could probably name every single doctor up till 2012 or 2013. Um, and the last couple years have been absolutely mad. Um, like I said, I started off with an occasional email, and now it seems like, and I'm sure Josh and some others get more than this, it seems like I get you know, five or ten emails and phone calls every day wanting uh, advice, and, uh, and it's awesome, but it's become overwhelming and um, great. Um, so this is a, a kind of, I think you have to show this slide when you're talking about the rise of anything. So I think when we started, started off, um, you know, we were definitely in that, that may be generous, that, that green line may be generous there, um, but we were definitely on that end of the curve. Um, and I think, you know, over the last couple of years, we're kind of moving into that second phase. Um, you know, uh, although people still might call a lot of us crazy, I think that there's, um, um, you know, a good, a, a good enough uh, momentum that we're kind of moving into that early, early adoption phase. So, um, there is a lot of awesome speakers here today. Um, I hope you guys learn a lot. Um, you guys probably have talked to a lot of us um, uh, off of the stage, but um, you guys are going to get a lot of really awesome information. But I'm not sure where everyone here is at in their, in their journey of direct primary care. Whether you've started a practice, you probably already know this, um, or whether you're going to start a practice, this is what it will feel like. 
It will feel like uh, you're by yourself. Um, I mean, the internet's nice. Facebook is great. But in your communities, you'll feel like you're totally by yourself and it will be scary as heck. But um, I, I think um, what you have to realize is that there's some really awesome people there. Um, this is an ode to Texas, by the way. I know, it's just funny. Some, someone said that they weren't a cowboy state anymore or something. But uh, uh, So just know that there are tons of people, uh, and many of them up here today, who will have your back um, and give you um, all the advice you need and occasionally share a beer with you as well. So thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Lee Gross, who will talk about differentiating between setting up a direct primary care practice and a concierge practice. Some of you know me, uh, many of you don't. My name is Lee Gross. I am originally from the greater Cleveland area. I uh, went to Ohio State for my undergraduate, spent a few years doing clinical research at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in their cardiology department. Uh, went to uh, Case Western Reserve Medical School with my friend, Dr. Chad Savage here. Um, <clears throat> did my residency at University Hospitals in Cleveland and decided I'd had enough of the gray skies of Cleveland and headed to Southwest Florida to practice family medicine. Um, and I had a, actually a very similar story to Ryan. I had a very tough fresh, a freshman year at, uh, at Ohio State and was told to get out of medicine um, and told to give up my, my hopes. And, and also, like, like uh, Ryan, got 4.0 GPAs for the next three years of, of undergraduate. And despite that, it still took me four years to get into medical school. <clears throat> Um, and when I did finally get into medical school and I finally got out of, resident, of residency and started my practice, it was like I felt like somebody was yanking the rug out from under me, seeing what was happening to the practice of medicine and seeing that we were losing all control and we were basically no longer practicing medicine. So it was like working so hard for all of my dreams and finally achieving them and having somebody pull them away right out from under my eyes. Um, and I just wouldn't go down without, without a fight. Uh, and just like everybody else probably in this room uh, with filling out forms and clicking boxes and, and treating the chart and, and uh, just meaningless, endless, stupid work that did nothing to take care of the patients, uh, that we had to have a better way of doing this. There had to be something better. What, what are we doing wrong that this is so complicated? Um, and we basically had an epiphany. Um, and my partner, Dr. Bill Crouch, is, is, is here with us uh, today, and he's going to be a, a presenter tomorrow on one of the panels. Um, we had an, our epiphany, and that's a strange name for a medical practice, but that's, in fact, what we had. Uh, and one of, one of our patients approached us and said, you know, I have a company of, of 10 employees in my heating and air conditioning company, and all 10 of my employees see you as their physician. Why am I paying an insurance company to pay you when my insurance rates keep going up. Why don't I just hire you to take care of my employees? And that way I can take out a catastrophic health insurance policy on them, and even if I paid their deductibles, I'm likely still gonna, gonna come out ahead at the end of the day. And that's sort of when that light went off that said, why are we insuring primary care? Why are we using the least efficient, least effective means of, of financing something, health insurance, to pay for the most basic aspect of medical care, primary care. It defies logic. You know, if I want to give you a dollar bill, why don't I just give you a dollar bill? Why should I give it to you, pass it through, have every single person that touches that dollar bill take a penny out of it, and then you have to pay a 30% administrative charge to cash that check? It's, it's absurd. So you've probably heard this line before if you know anything about this. We don't insure gasoline for our cars. We don't insure light bulbs for our houses. You can imagine what, what uh, uh, homeowner's insurance and what car insurance would cost if we, if we had to f use insurance to finance the basic stuff. Uh, but that's what we're asking our health insurance to do. So health insurance is not insurance. Insurance is a hedge against a catastrophic loss, an unexpected loss. What we have is our bloated prepaid medical packages, uh, which is very expensive. So what we basically did was... Um, we created a membership-based model, and this was back in 2000, 2010. Um, and we wanted to start introducing some market forces because, you know, uh, we wanted to start seeing some competition. Because yeah, this is what happens in, in the free market, right? You, you bring a, a television screen to the, to the market, it's $700. You start competing on price and quality, making it better, making it more effectively. Make it, and before you know it, it's a $200 Black Friday special at Walmart. But for some reason, this is what free market and, and competition in healthcare looks like in the United States. Well, there really is no free market. I mean, there's competition, sure, 
uh, but competition in a price fixed system that everybody's competing to do as much as possible for the patient and, and, and run up the bill as high as possible. So if we're trying to finance healthcare, we're gonna go ahead and create a, a, a package and we're gonna call that package health insurance that everyone has to buy. And in that health insurance, we're gonna put your nice affordable primary care, but then we're gonna bundle that with very expensive end of life care. Let's put in a three month hospitalization in there. Let's put nursing home in there, chemotherapy, or bypass surgery. All that has to be sold at one price and we're gonna call that price insurance. And what that does is it basically artificially raises the access cost to primary care because there's so much bloat in that package. But if you go ahead and strip out the primary care from the other expensive stuff, the costs come crashing down. It makes primary care very affordable to the masses. So we set ours up as a, as a hybrid because we had a very full practice. We had about 3,500 patients apiece. Uh, we both owned homes and had mortgages and we owned our building and uh, we were not in a position to cut off our entire revenue or income stream. So we set up our practice as, as a hybrid, uh, not knowing what a hybrid was at the time, but this is how our lawyer advised us. There might be other ways to do this, but this is how our lawyer advised us to do it at the time. So we have our existing practice, LLC, which we see patients under, we're employees of, or partners in. We set up our direct primary care as Epiphany Health uh, as a separate entity, and our patients contract with it, and we then contract with, our practice contract is with Epiphany uh, with a provider agreement so that we are not violating our insurance contracts. And it, it took a lot, of, a lot of work, a lot of energy, and a lot of legal work to make sure that we were not violating our insurance contracts. Uh, we do not bill Medicare patients. We do not presently enroll Medicare patients or collect a fee for Medicare patients. Many do, but they're opted out. Or you know, We'll talk about that in, in other panels here as to how you go about that. And I know uh, Phil Eskew will get into that certainly tomorrow, if not, if not today. So we're charging $50 a month for a basic membership, $25 a month for the first child, $10 a month for each additional child. Uh, and everything that we include in the office, everything that we do in the office is included for no extra extra charge after that membership fee. So, you know, things that we might charge $150, $200 for are included: joint injections, EKGs, uh, take off of skin cancer. Uh, all that's included at no extra charge. And what we've also done is reached out and we said, what What does a primary care doctor need to adequately per perform his or her craft? We need support of uh, affordable imaging services, affordable uh, laboratory services, affordable physical therapy. And so we reached out to independent practices in the community and said, if I send you a cash paying patient and they agree to pay you in full at the time of service, what can you sell those, those services for? This is not charity. Uh, we want you to be happy when these patients call you and they show up on your doorstep. We just want the price to be fair. So if you don't have to, to wait six months to get paid, if you don't have to try to collect from them, get denials, prior authorization, step edits, you name it. Uh, what's it worth, worth to you to, to get the money up front? And the prices we got were, were pretty uh, un, unbelievable. Uh, CT scans for $200, X, plain x-rays for $25, uh, stress, stress test, nuclear stress test for about $500. Uh, colonoscopy uh, is $1,100. That includes the anesthesia, the facility fee, and the surgeon's, the surgeon's fee. Now, you may think that that's a lot of money, uh, but quite frankly, that's what people are paying per month in health insurance premiums. And they, only, they don't need one of those things every year. So this is an actual hospital bill. You don't have to read this, but I put it up here just to show you what, that this is in fact real. This is a patient of mine that went to the emergency room for abdominal pain. Uh, Full disclosure, I'm on the board of this hospital and they hate that I travel around the country showing this picture. Uh, <clears throat> and I told them, I'll stop as soon as you fix the problem anyway. Uh, so I can see people in my office almost right away. I can order stat labs, I can order stat imaging, um, and in fact, they probably could get into my office and see me faster than the weight that they would have in the emergency room if they went to the ER. So that bill, came to about $20,000 for everything that patient had done in the office. So instead of going to the emergency room, if that patient came to my office and I ordered a stat, stat lab, stat imaging, and, and worked up that patient through my office with my pricing, uh, anyone want to take a guess at what that price might come to? 1200 somebody said. Yeah, I heard all. $278.79.
So now I have health insurance. So you're going to get that $20,000 bill, and what's going to happen is you're going to go to the ER, you're going to get the $20,000 bill, and your insurance company is going to send you an explanation of benefits that says, thank goodness you had XYZ insurance because we just saved your bacon. It's only $5,000. We wrote off $15,000. No, you paid $1,000 a month in premiums to pay $5,000 for $300 for the medical care uh, is essentially what happened. Um, and so the hospitals are continuing to, incentive to incentivize to keep those prices high. The insurance companies uh, are also incentivized to, to, to not disclose the actual prices of these services. So I know you, you guys have all probably seen this, this slide here, which basically shows the growth of administrators and versus a growth of physicians. Uh, you may even see it in other presenters. Uh, I show this to, to emphasize the skyrocketing cost of healthcare in the United States. And I, I only show this to point out the fact that our patients that signed up for our program in 2011 are paying the same exact amount in 2016 that they were paying us in 2011. Okay, that's the skyrocketing cost of healthcare. In fact, we've actually lowered the price. So a family of four in our program is $135 a month. After that, they don't pay anything uh, for services in our office. Uh, in 2014, a standard PPO plan without any subsidies at all uh, is approaching $2,000 per month. So the difference between the cost of the basic care that most people are needing versus the coverage that they're buying is about $22,000 per year. So now if we look at that, that same family of four and say, instead of, instead of getting that Cadillac insurance plan, instead of having your employer buy this really expensive plan, uh, why don't we go ahead and just give you a, a really catastrophic plan, let's say a $10,000 deductible, and a direct primary care membership. Okay, so the, the red line uh, that you see there, the $232,000 uh, is the cost of that PPO plan over 10 years for family four, assuming that the price of the health insurance plan did not go up in 10 years, which we all know it would never go up. Um, the black line is the cost of a, of a high deductible health plan, a true catastrophic health plan, uh, and the membership. So the patients paying $96,000 or $100,000 uh, do not pay for any of the routine medical care beyond that. The people in the PPO are going to pay co-payments and, and so forth. Uh, the difference between those two is over 10 years is a savings of about $135,000. So then the common question is, well, who has $10,000 to in the event of an emergency? You know, well, let's just assume that this is the sickest family in the country, and they hit that $10,000 deductible every single year for 10 years. That's $100,000. They're still pocketing $35,000 over 10 years. And that company that came to us with the heating and air conditioning that had their 10 employees, that company would just save about $1.3 million over 10 years. Um, and again, most generous employer, they're going to go ahead and pay that deductible for all their employees. Uh, then they only save, they only save $350,000. So... The Affordable Care Act, assuming that it worked exactly as planned, which we know it's working exactly as planned, um, expected there were going to be 32 million people newly insured. Uh, many of those people would be, would be placed in Medicaid. The closest doctor to me that takes new adult Medicaid patients is about two hours away. Uh, and the estimates were that 26 million people were going to remain uninsured. That was the plan if it worked perfectly. Um, and so... That cost on that was $1.8 trillion over, over 10 years. So instead of doing that, instead of covering half of the uninsured, we go ahead and make sure that all 58 million people have the basic care that they need. We're going to go ahead and give them all access to a direct primary care. Every one of you are going to search your practices. We're going to fill up all your practices. Uh, we're going to give them care, but not necessarily coverage. So the net 10-year savings compared to the Affordable Care Act is $1.4 trillion. Just. Just 1.4. <laughs> just 1.4. Um, so, of course, pie in the sky. Um, so this is the, the, the general theme, I think, of the, of the, uh, the conversation you're going to see over the next couple of days. So I'm going to go ahead and, and stop right there. Uh, Plenty of time for, for questions throughout the next couple days. If you see me, if you see any of us, make sure you stop, ask questions. Uh, again, tomorrow's really the, the in, your weed, in the weeds, uh, but uh, we'll have time at the end of this panel for some, some questions. I'm really excited for the rest of these panels, so thank you for your time. Our next speaker is uh, Josh Umber. He's going to uh, talk about 
the uh, implementing value-added services into a direct primary care practice. Josh? Well, it's definitely an honor and a privilege to be able to be up here and, and share what we've learned with, with other doctors. But, but first, to share a fun fact between Ryan and I. Besides sharing similar tastes in clothes and, and casuality, we both also graduated at the top of our med school class. Bell curve. Bell curve. Top of the bell curve, yeah. I was just the left side. Yeah, it's, it's one side or the other. I was never able to make that joke until I heard Ryan make that joke, and I told him immediately I'm going to steal that, because that's, that's brilliant. Uh, so it's a sharing community. Uh, you know, good artists borrow, great artists steal, and, and what we want to do is bring you know, the, the best that we have learned over the time and share it with, you know, each next doctor doing direct care so that the movement gets as much momentum as possible. Because we really have a huge struggle, despite the fact that there's, you know, a huge crowd here, there's 250,000 primary care physicians who aren't doing direct care yet. And, and that's not good for them and it's not good for their patients. So as we collectively learn from each other and build that movement, I think that's a little bit different than what we're used to seeing in healthcare. Uh, it's a little bit proprietary, it's a little bit closed off. And here the group can't wait to share what they've done, what they've learned, mistakes they've made, but think lessons they've learned. Um, that's some of the value we bring to each other uh, in the direct care movement is is that we can share and learn so much. Uh, one of the things I love doing though about the, the direct care process is the fact that we are, are putting the focus directly where it should be, and that's on the patient. And, and adding value to your practice not only helps you get started and, and grow quicker and be successful, but it's, it's helping our patients in a way that I, I, can't, I don't think we can say we've been doing for a long time. Uh, it, a lot of people are quick to blame government or insurance or regulators or all these other things for the, the problems in healthcare. And I would say we should blame ourselves first. You, we're the gatekeepers of care. We're, we're the delivery there. We're right there on the front lines. And a refusal to go look for value for our patients means our patients never get it. And, and by default, we're not helping them. If, if we really take our oath seriously of do no harm, that should include do no financial harm. You, you, present as much value to our patients as we possibly can because they deserve it that way. And, and I have a supercomputer in my pocket because technology industries understand they have to continually add value and innovate and push and keep prices low. And, and in healthcare, we somehow reject that often. Um, I don't know if it's a sense that medicine is different than a business or it shouldn't be or we're afraid to mix the two, but we shouldn't. And the, the most successful direct care practices are the ones who are, are bringing so much to the table that a patient looks at that, that math like that, like Lee's, and says, my God, why wouldn't I join? Um, if anything, where's the catch? Th this should sound so, uh, too good to be true to the average patient, employer, and, and honestly, even insurance companies. Uh, the insurance companies don't trust us because we don't trust them, rightfully so. Uh, but, but they, they haven't seen this much value before. They don't know why an EKG can be free when they're paying $100 for it. But an EKG cost me 36 cents in the office. So I, I can charge a dollar for it, and you know, 300% profit, you know, damn capitalism. Um, or I can give it away free. Uh, there was actually, he was a Texas businessman whose name escapes me, but he said, if you wouldn't charge your friend to do it, don't charge your customer to do it. So in the hospitality side of healthcare, I don't charge for the coffee, the water, the tea, the Wi-Fi in my office. I, I want that to be an inviting part of our culture. So why would I charge the 36 cents for an EKG? Um, I did a hemorrhoidectomy uh, Wednesday, uh, actually not on a lawyer, Phil, um, but uh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> my dad's a lawyer, so um, I can make that joke. Uh, Actually, he used to be a trash man. Growing up uh, for 20 years, my dad was a trash man. And uh, his motto was, satisfaction guaranteed or double your trash back. Uh, no complaints. That's how you add value. But uh, now that he's a lawyer, I still usually tell people he's a trash man. It's, it's less embarrassing. Um, so patient asked me, he goes, oh, so just so I can tell my wife, well, what's this going to cost on our bill? I said, oh, I I'm sorry if we didn't make that clear. It's free. And, and, and he was, you know, had to explain to him 
how it can be free, but I don't have $2 in the cost of that. He's going to go out and tell more people about that free surgery, um, details left to the side, than, than I could pay for in marketing. Because you know, if, I, if I charge him $50, which would be fair, of course, he, it'd be $50. If it's free, he doesn't know what to value it at, but he's impressed. And, and there's actually a, a business book, uh, the uh, on a free economy, Google and, and lots of industries offer things free because it gets you in the door. But he's going to just be so happy about that that he, the, the transferable trust I get, as he tells his friends, that helps grow the model. That, that'll be $500 that will last me for years as he tells people the story uh, of a procedure he got at no cost that he needed. That's how we add value. Uh, some of the other things direct care does is, is roughly the unlimited or, or, you know, or, or high number of office visits, uh, home visits, um, technology. Uh, we use technology everywhere else in our lives. We, we all used you know, an ample amount of technology just to get here. Uh, Uber and, and the hotels or Airbnb or watching Netflix in the airport or something, but then we get to healthcare and we quit using technology. But we'll all say that, that communication is, is the, the, the foundation of any good relationship, unless it's a patient. Then we, we make them go through the nurse, or the secretary, the receptionist, and eight other people before it gets to the doctor. So direct care being able to, to take technology, bring it right to the forefront of what our patients can use, and that saves them money, that saves them time, that saves them worry. That is a value. And we may not look at it like that, but it really is. Uh, the, the amount of uh, assistance you can provide a patient just by being there. And they can text a picture of the spider bite each day just because they're worried about it. Or they're too afraid to talk to you, you know, about their depression face to face so they can email you all their worries. There's a huge value that we bring because the industry, uh, the insurance world doesn't see that as a value because they're paying for it and they can't get a, a return on investment for that time. And, and it's a little bit of a shame that if insurance doesn't pay us to do it, we just don't do it. You know, it's, I'm sorry, I won't even offer you to email. My, even though it's, it's good standard of care, we, we fail to reach out fully as professionals towards our patients to add value because the system, most things are a systems error, the, the system didn't uh, give us an opportunity or allow us to, or we were not taught to innovate within or around the system. Um, some of the other things I love, like Lee has already posted these wonderful numbers on, wholesale prices on medications, labs, pathology, um, imaging, to the point of ridiculousness. Uh, you know, Lee was telling a story yesterday about um, a cancer he took off a gentleman's arm, it was quoted three thousand dollars for Mohs surgery, like. You, you need a scarless forearm, um, <laughs> that he did for 30, and a dermatologist was mad at him for telling people that because that's going to destabilize the healthcare world. <laughs> but I hope so, yeah. Let's destabilize that. You know, Apple, Google, they all fight against each other viciously uh, to, to bring us a better product at a better price. I, you know, I, I take that as a badge of honor that if we're fighting uh, so hard for our patients to bring them value, uh, then we can't help but be going in the right direction. Uh, we, we, we worried for, for decades that our patients couldn't afford their medications, but we collectively didn't go fix it. And now that you know, except Texas, um, that you can dispense wholesale medications, that is another huge savings. Save a patient $100 a month on a medicine, that's, that's, that's doing what we're here to do. They're happier, they're healthier, they have more money for their children or, or anything because we've helped them on medicines and labs and imaging. They get more health more often for a fraction of the cost. Th that's the silicon rule uh, 10x value. If you, if you can't bring something innovative to the table, if it's not 10x better, no one's interested. Elon Musk can send a payload to the space station for 95% less than NASA. Yeah, that probably destabilizes NASA some, um, but in a good way, it pushes everything. And so I, I, we have to take that value um, drive on ourselves. Um, you know, there's fantastic books about Walmart or Amazon. Uh, I would say Jeff Bezos has a pathological desire to save money uh, for his customers. Where's that in healthcare? If he'll do that for, for books and, and, and everyday stuff, we can definitely take pride in doing that for our patients' health. That's the value that will justify your membership or, or your, your fee or your visit fee, anything. 
But we can even take that so much further as to help employers decrease their cost of insurance by 30 to 60 percent. This becomes a national solution that we're adding value to our, our profession, our patients, our families, our country, because we can help more people get jobs, better paying jobs, have more flexibility. If people can leave their jobs more often, they're more often to start a business and because health insurance is more affordable. There's so many great things at the risk of a Napoleon complex here, uh, conquer the world, uh, that we can do if we come together. Um, and I still love the quote, you, uh, alone you can go fast, together you can go far. And this group and, and of direct care doctors taking what they learned this week and, and, and taking it back to 10, 20 other doctors that they know around them, this will be a movement that will suddenly hit the hockey stick part and, and take off. And, and that'll be you know, thousands and millions of patients who, who get a better value for their health care because uh, of events like this. So um, we look forward to answering questions in the panel and of course all, all weekend long. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. If that medicine thing doesn't work out, you've got a career as a stand-up comic. <laughs> and people were afraid that you weren't going to, you're talking about your uniform. You wore a collared shirt today, so that's actually, you know, a plus. So that's great. You know, you, you talked about how uh, the, the movement in direct primary care, when, when, I, when I evangelize for direct primary care, I would like to tell people that direct primary care is the second fastest growing delivery model in America after the hospital employment of doctors. And I'd like to see that, that those numbers flip around. Our last speaker for the first session is uh, Chad Savage from Michigan. I'll say that. And um, he's going to talk about the challenges and suggestions of marketing a direct primary care practice. Well, thank you very much. Just a quick observation. Uh, two of us trained in one program and two of us trained in another. I bet you could never guess, based on our uniforms, who trained where. Uh, uh, a quick uh, thing, you know, last night uh, my uh, airplane broke. I almost didn't get here. I was absolutely terrified my luggage wouldn't make it. Ryan, Josh, thank you for making me never worry about that again. So. Um, say, say a little bit about yourself, uh, despite what a little known fact about myself is, um, despite being the first person to go barefoot to both polar ice caps, I was also the man who held the ladder for Neil Armstrong. But, all right, honestly, I went to the University of Michigan, and yet, okay, that was before I was born, but, but anyway, uh, uh, Lee and I actually went to, to Case Western together, and uh, despite our, our undergraduates have uh, remained uh, good friends over all the years, so blessed for that. And then I went to Washington University in St. Louis for my residency training. I now uh, am uh, a member of Your Choice Direct Care in Brighton, Michigan. I have a partner, Dr. Naomi Cook. And uh, we are in the early adopter stage. You hear about the innovators. I am truly honored to be on the stage with these guys because these guys are the innovators. I'm an early adopter. I took what they did. I tried to expand upon it whatever little bit I could do. But they were the ones who, who set this up. So we have a lot to thank to these gentlemen up on the stage. Um, my topic is marketing your direct primary care practice. It's kind of a challenging topic because it can feel like shameless self-promotion 101. And most of us aren't really into that, right? I mean, that seems kind of unseemly, kind of seedy, but I can assure you that that can be the difference between having a successful direct primary care practice and, and one that is not. So when Lee first contacted me and asked me to do this, I've never talked on this topic before, I immediately thought about hard advertising options, things like newspaper ads, television commercials, and radio ads. But I quickly decided, don't do any of them. They're all a big waste of money. Most of you, specifically if you're coming out of training or you're making conversion from an insurance-based practice, don't have a lot of resources. Most of us have found that these are just big money sinks. So don't bother using any of them. But there is one thing that I'd really strongly recommend that you do. Because it's the thing that works really, really well, and you've kind of heard that referred to already today. And the one thing that works really, really well is you. 
You are your best advertising. Ryan was talking about how he had to get out and do a lot of grunt work, do kind of innovative things, try to draw attention to himself. And even now that is still true, even in the early adopter stage, I was one of the first people in my area of Michigan to do this, and everybody thought I was crazy. Everybody was looking at me as though I had something stuck in my, my teeth when I would talk to them about that. And despite the fact that I did, I tried to explain, okay, no, no, I floss, I floss. Any dentists here? Okay, no, I won't have you clap. Um, so anyway, it works through things like presenting, like we're doing today, through networking, or excuse me, got those backwards, and educating, and that's the big one. And, the, and, uh, and we basically need everyone to become ambassadors of direct primary care. And by doing so, you will free yourself and your patients from the coercive effect of the third-party payer system. And the best way to educate others is to actually to educate ourselves. And some great source of this, because you really need to know the topic, is, uh, is, and I understand he may actually be talking at the conference, is David Goldhill, Catastrophic Care. This book is amazing. It is the single best source that explains what's wrong with the current system and why we need to, yeah, definitely write it down. This is an uh, earth-shattering book. He's not a physician. Uh, he's the CEO of uh, a game show network, as I understand. Uh, but I don't know how he got so involved in healthcare. But he 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 broke this down better than any healthcare policy expert ever could. It it was it's it even goes into the psychology of how the insurance model is broken. And once you've decided to do this, you want to see another option. Think about Doug Frago's book, Direct Primary Care. This explains. Yeah, thank you, Doug, for doing that. The, uh, that, that explains what we're trying to move to and even give somewhat of a roadmap and talks about marketing and other topics, so it's a really good option. Um, so, uh, uh, so with networking, you know, the practice of medicine is personal, so the best way to expand it and describe it is to engage in personal interactions, networking, and opportunities abound. You just have to look at them. Things like the, the Rotary Club, the Chamber of Commerce, various charity organizations like Habitat for Humanity. And I'm not talking about writing a check, sending it out, and expecting that people are going to flood you. That just doesn't work. I'm talking local charities that you get involved in. You get FaceTime, you know, food banks, or whatever it may be. Uh, uh, schools, churches, uh, basically whenever and wherever is an opportunity to network. And it usually starts with informal interactions. Uh, you know, people come up and say, hey, what are you doing? I heard you're doing something, something neat and innovative. Hopefully they're that positive. This brings up the opportunity for what I call the one-minute presentation. Have it in your back pocket. Oh, I'm doing something great. It's called direct primary care. Be positive, right? You know, you want to explain this to people, and it is a positive thing. Oh, it's great. It's an insurance-free practice of medicine. Our costs are so much less. We can save you so much money that you actually don't have to buy as expensive a policy. You can save thousands of dollars every single year. None of that's fabricated. All of that's true, so you do not feel bad about sharing that with people. Um, now, when you do that, however you choose to phrase that, your, your own one-minute presentation, if they just look at you blank and have no interest whatsoever, don't waste your breath, okay? It's just, you know, be nice, keep going. Maybe in time, maybe they'll open up and want to learn more, but don't be pushy. Don't try to force it on them. Uh, but if they are interested, expound. Oh, it's a, it's a membership model of primary care, you know? It's a low cost, budgetable, predictable, uh, affordable. It's like about the cost of a gym membership, and with that, you can see us as much as you need. You know, our practice starts as low as 39 bucks a month. And with that, you can see us as much as you want. We do everything we'd classically do in a primary care office. If you need a basic biopsy, a joint injection, EKGs, whatever it is, we just do it. If you forget, forget your wallet, who cares? We know who you are. You already paid your bill. Just come in and use us. We're, we're thrilled to have you there. Um, be, uh, you know, be uh, light, be informal, be conversational, don't be pushy. Um, and, and those kind of opportunities can open up the opportunity for formal presentations in audiences. Now with this, no group should be too small. Remember, great ideas start small and grow big. You're turning light bulbs on. The interesting thing too is you never know who that person is that you talk to who is pivotal. They could, they could know a big business owner. They could have a huge family. There could be uh, so many opportunities. So get out there. Or they, they themselves may not, may just be one person, but they talk to somebody else, it builds, it grows. Put the legwork in that will vastly improve your ability to succeed. Get to know various presentation programs. I primarily present on Keynote. There's also PowerPoint. Get to know PowerPoint, okay? 
Keynote is a great program. I use it all the time, but it doesn't always convert well to PowerPoint. PowerPoint is fairly ubiquitous. When you go to centers that have these things set up, um, you know, they're going to want a PowerPoint program, so, so get used to PowerPoint. When you present, be authentic. Direct primary care is fantastic. We talk all the time about how it's cheaper, but it's not always cheaper for that individual. You may have a union member who has a Cadillac plan, has no option to change, and it has no co-pays. They pay for everything. Okay, that's going to be hard to make that cheaper. So be authentic. Be, admit the limitations. It's not always cheaper, but it is always better. You're going to get a doctor who, who has no conflicts of interest, who will, who will see you same day, who is not being coerced by your insurance company, potentially paid more to deny you care. I'll explain that later if anybody wants to understand my rationale. If you look at the payment structures, they talk about patient-centeredness. Once you get past the title, it ends its payment-centeredness. It's not about care. Um, so it is always better. Um, and I'll give you some examples of kind of what I do myself in some of my presentations, and everybody can do their own way. So when I'm, I'm doing this, I say, well, you know, it's a membership model of care. For a low-cost, budgetable, predictable uh, monthly membership, you get all office visits included. And that's vitally important. I try to stress this point. Studies have clearly shown that if your per visit charge goes up, utilization of primary care services go, goes down. Well, that sounds good. Saves money, right? Uh uh. It actually increases aggregate costs because now people are so scared to use their doctor that when they do present to the hospital or to the doctor, they're sicker, more advanced states of illness. They end up going to the hospital. It's penny wise, pound foolish. It actually aggregate costs go up. So we are actually the inexpensive cost point. Um, so you want to have all that uh, included. We also include all in-office diagnostics, EKGs, spirometries, pulse oximetries, flu swab, strep tests, et cetera. It's a wrap price. Your analyses cost 10 cents to do. You know, I think it was Josh Ryan or maybe everybody commented about how this is, that's just ridiculous. The, the billing of that 10 cent is more than just doing the procedure itself. You actually lose money billing those kind of things. Uh, it includes all in-office uh, uh, procedures, so joint injections, basic biopsies, skin tag removals, and what I call virtual home visits, uh, colloquially known as telemedicine. No one knows what telemedicine is. I think virtual home visits encapsulates this better. We're using technology to allow you to access remotely your doctor, to receive care where it's convenient to you. That is something called an opportunity cost, meaning the value of your time if you're not driving in a car, waiting in a, a waiting room. There was a study that recently showed that we waste $52 billion in the United States every year waiting around in doctor's offices. Direct primary care is helping to correct that. And then I give examples. So this is a slide. I, and when I have this, actually, there's actually a sound effect of itching, and I act it out on the stage. I go, imagine, oh, imagine, you wake up on a Saturday morning, and you got this itchy rash, and it's terrible, and you're thinking, oh, gosh, I was in the garden yesterday, and I thought I saw that poison. I mean, but I swear I stayed away from it, but I guess I didn't. Oh, this is horrible. I, you know, I'll wait until Monday, and I'll call my insurance-based doctor. But wait a second. He's an insurance-based doctor, and in the United States, it takes 19.5 days on average to see your doctor. So, oh, gosh, I'll be lucky if I get in this week. This is just so terrible. I can't stand it. Oh, just forget it. I'm going to the ER. Slow the pace down. Show the calm of direct primary care. And I say, no, forget about all that. Pull out your cell phone. Take a picture of it. Sound effect. Uh, <laughs> incredible. You guys actually thought I took a picture, didn't you? Is that good? Uh, you know, text it to me. Hey, Doc, it's in the garden yesterday. Got this itchy rash. Think it could be poison ivy? Why, that does look like poison ivy. Let me send some triumphs in loan for you. Let me know if you don't feel better. Quick, easy, convenient, effective, cost-effective. Wonderful for that patient, but also wonderful for the patient who was really, really ill. Because now, in your office, instead of wasting time on a visit that could have easily been handled in moments in a text, you're actually able to dedicate more time to that patient who may have been just dis discharged from the hospital and really needs more of your time. So it's allowing doctors the ability to allocate your own precious time resource. It's actually amazingly important. Uh, and then, for depending on the audience, I'll switch over. Some people like more numbers. If it, when I have my business presentations, use pictures, use uh, graphs, you know, uh, tell stories. People remember those. Don't, don't just say, hey, here's a number, wow. You know, okay, I'm about to show a number, here we go, wow. Uh, so so um, 
uh, I do this for my more, the guys who want to get into the nitty gritty of it, you know, the, the, the uh, business owners and such, and I, I use line items, kind of like Lee did, and I say, well, this is what it would, it would cost in an insurance model. This is what we can charge in our practice. And I tell a story about, I use names, I use faces, images. Bob, you know, 58-year-old, great guy, diabetic, comes in four times a year. But diabetics get sick, he gets a case of pneumonia, they get a lot of heart disease, he has about a chest pain. And I show aggregate costs over the entire year. All his maintenance stuff, first page, visits, labs, everything, a flu shot even. And then I show what happens with the sick visits. Uh, you know, chest x-ray, stre uh, stress test, uh, Holter monitor, and then I show Boy, if he had done this through the insurance model, that would have charged out at $5,200. But when we do it through a direct approach, including the membership, we can do it all for $832, and he actually got better care under that model. But again, numbers that have only a role. Have graphs, has visuals. This is where I say don't use uh, Keynote, because this is a graph I'm about to show you that I normally do in Keynote. Makes perfect sense. Eh, it's okay here. But people, people understand graphs. So let me explain this quickly. You don't even have to explain it in my keynote presentation. The gray is your premium uh, based on different plans. The red is your, uh, what you spend on top of that through deductible, co-insurance, direct pay approach, whatever it may be. So on the left is a uh, true quote from eHealthInsurance.com for a platinum plan for this individual. And then I plugged in all those numbers to find out what he'd actually pay at the end of the year. So after he pays that mountain of a premium, $14,000 plus for an individual in 2016, it's going up next year. He hadn't even seen a doctor yet. He's still at a 10% charge on an artificial price. All the prices in medicine are a joke. They're all artificial. So you pay a 10% charge on an artificial price. It's like when you go, hey, it's 50% off every single day. Well, it's not really 50% off. You're just overcharging and making a joke. But anyway, um, so, so he spends about 15 grand in total in a, in a year where he, was, he had some uh, utilization, but it wasn't insane uh, for a diabetic. And uh, so he goes, okay, I might be smart. That's a huge waste. Almost never, never. When you actually do the numbers, I, and I really educate people on this, it never makes sense to do a platinum plan. It just never makes sense You'd, if you actually pay it yourself. So then he goes, I'm going to be smart and get a bronze plan. That's the one second to the left. And he cuts his premium cost by almost eight grand. Problem is, now he's high deductible. Now he is paying those false prices when he utilizes the services. So he pays, they, take, they cover the wellness stuff, so I drop that off of that total price. So he still pays over $4,500 on top of that. Now the next one, the third from the left or second from the right, whichever way you want to look, half full, half empty. Um, the, if he combined that bronze plan with the direct pay approach, he would only add $800 on top of that $8,000 savings in the premium cost. But if he was really, really smart, because now he's getting good prices, right? Now he's getting less expensive insurance, but he's getting good prices. He's melding two worlds together very nicely. But if he was really smart, there's something called the health sharing plans. I think they're the best kept secret in medical finance. Um, the, most of them are Christian-based, Samaritan MediShare, uh, but there's one now, Liberty, Liberty Health Sharing, Liberty Direct. I think Hint works with them. I know Hint works with them. They're fantastic. They, you do not have to even be Christian to use that product. It's a coverage product like insurance. I think it's important you guys know about this because they meld incredibly well with direct primary care. So now his premium price dropped like a, like a rock. Um, his savings, if he just changed how he financed it for one year, he actually got better care on the right because he's going direct primary care doctor. One year savings, over $11,000 by just changing how you pay for the system. So other ways to increase interest are things like social media. These are free, Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, you know, whatever it may be. They're a great way of getting the word out. Uh, they're not inclusive, but they're free. Again, it's, it takes your time to, to kind of be active on social media. They can help drive uh, traffic to things like your website. Now, Josh, Josh is wonderful. As I said, I'm an early adopter. He helped me set up my practice, no doubt. The guy has got unbelievable energy. Are you, do you, can we do a drug test on you? All right, uh, no, no? Hey. He's refusing that, by the way. Leave it for the record. Um, so highly functional, put a lot of information on it, make it work for you. Um, you, you know, so you, your receptionist doesn't have 30 minutes when every single person calls to try to explain it. Have a site that they can reference, allow people to on their own time in the comfort of their own home, research what you're doing, learn about it. So these things are, are cookie cutter. They're already pre kind of programmed. You just got to put your information in. They're very inexpensive. Make them a tool for yourself. And then of course there is some role for some print uh, type advertising. By these I mean things like trifolds and cards and things of that sort. Vistaprint. Wonderful, cheap, you can design them yourself, very inexpensive. 
uh, when you do presentations, people like to walk out with something in their hands. Look at everybody here got a packet today, right? So uh, same kind of thing. Uh, you can put your information in, they're going to want to know it. And then newspapers, television, and radio. Ron Burgundy. The, uh, the, uh, but not advertising. Uh, Op-eds. You know, put some time, write, write about direct primary care, try to get a little free press. Uh, things like radio and, and TV interviews, should the opportunities avail themselves, are a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to get the uh, idea and the concept out there. Uh, and when you do paid advertising, people don't believe it. They know you paid for it. But when you're in an interview with somebody on a news station, it gives it an additional level of credibility and people tend to listen to it more. Um, so, now what is the second best source of advertising? Number one is you. Second best is your patients. So when you become a direct primary care doctor, when you have them in your practice, give fantastic care. Be responsive. So when people text you or, or page you or whatever, I like to kind of challenge myself to see how quickly I can respond to everything. People love that. I had one patient who was in Florida who texted me, and, and I, I wish I could quote it precisely, but she said, how fantastically unusual, uh, how unusually fantastic it was to have that kind of access to a doctor. You're selling people by just, by just being a good doctor. It, and, then, and then don't be shy about asking them, saying, hey, if you like your care, go tell your friends. You know, they'll brag about it. They'll say, oh, I sent you three people. They're really excited to help you out because this is an exciting movement. And people are, are excited to be in, involved in something like this. Um, take your time. Okay, so be quick on responding, but when people do come into your office, most of us brag that we schedule in 30-minute increments. That means you're free. You can take the time with it. Give them the care you know you can, you, you know you can give, that you're trained to give. You are now unshackled from the CPT restrictions about how to run a practice, right? Oh, one visit, one, one problem today, you want another, come back another day, okay? We can build that. Or it's four, or it's four if it's two on four. So all those limitations, all those restrictions just fall away. You can be the doctor you want to be. Honestly say, hey, any other issues going on? You know, uh, what, what happens now when you do an insurance model? Anybody who's insurance, you go, oh, God, they said yes. Oh, God, I got to run. I got to, you know. Um, so it's a terrible thing. In this model, you're, you're scheduled appropriately. It's actually, it's, it's perfectly fine. They love it. And then even if they say no, you may have enough time to go, well, how the kids been? Work going well? You get to know your patients. Isn't that why most of us went into primary care? It's, it's rewarding, not just, it's not for, you know, we didn't go, in, we wanted to be rich, we'd be, you know, doing a urology thing here. So, all right, I know, it's just nice clothes. I assume he's rich. The, um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, most of us, I mean, yeah, we all want to make a good income, but most of us forewent the specialties to have that relationship, and you could do it in direct primary care, so it's awesome. Um, be accessible. Most of us ever, or brag about same-day accessibility. You're sick, we'll get you in the same day. We're going to save you the cost on ER visits. The worst place to access care from a financial standpoint is in ER. If you're going to have reserve capacity in a system, why do it where you've got trauma teams and crash carts and everything waiting? You should have that reserve capacity in, in the primary care setting because that's the cheapest place to access care. We do that in direct primary care. Make sure you live up to that promise. So basically, be the type of doctor that you can be. Be the best doctor you can be. Live up to the promise of direct primary care. Um, now, it's easy to the sick patients. The, uh, I wish my plane worked like that yesterday. The, uh, um, it's easy in, in, uh, uh, to keep our sick patients, uh, to make them understand the value we're giving them because they're coming in all the time. The hardest ones to keep sometime are actually the healthy because if they're just getting that monthly bill and they, they're like, what am I doing this for? You can lose them. So stay in constant contact with them. Most of the EMRs, and Josh has developed a wonderful one called Atlas, um, have the ability to send out batch emails. You can send them to all your patients. Uh, utilize that. Uh, you do things like, uh, hey, we, you know, it's flu season. Here's some ideas about not getting sick. And by the way, we do flu shots for $9.99. Or just recently, we sent out one that a local hospital was doing mammograms for 50 bucks. It had nothing to do with me. I just made sure my patients knew it. So they knew, even the healthy ones, that we were looking out for them. We were providing them a benefit, even if they weren't in the office. And if you do save them money, don't expect that they know it. Tell them, okay? Because you, you can go, gosh, I got that for this. Oh, they're going to love it. And they can look at it. Okay. But, hey, that was like several hundred bucks. You just got it for three. You know, you, come on, jump up and down. So, 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 so I actually do that. And a classic example is Flonase. I actually took a picture of a local store, and so I don't get sued. I won't see who they are, of their sale price for Flonase for $23. And I, I put it uh, with all the markers of that store taken off. I, I, I made fun of it on Facebook. And I'm like, here, we get it for $3.90. And they're bragging it's on sale for $23.99. 
Um, and I tell people that, and they love it, and they get excited too, and they shake their head, and they're like, that's crazy. You got a thousand hydrochlorothiazide for $6.99, $6.99. With even the 10% markup, you know, there, you could treat a year's worth, we cut them in half, you can treat a year's worth of hypertension for about a buck. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but basically, it is much cheaper to keep an existing patient than to recruit a new one. So give your patients fantastic care. Quick uh, comment for those of us who are converting. So if you, I was a converter. Uh, Insurance-based practice, I, I moved on over. Um, there's a lot of pathology out there, okay? I, I'm, I'm on the, so, and I don't just mean warts and things of that sort. I mean amongst us, as doctors, we are human. When you convert, you will not have even half of the people come with you, no matter how good a doctor you are, and it is easy when that happens to you to think, oh my God, everybody really hates me. Um, but but um, just don't, don't feel that way, okay? Don't hold a grudge. Um, when you, you know, it's, it, they, a lot of people just don't get it yet. We're educating, right? You know, or they're scared of change. So instead, when you see them in store, don't walk the other way or glare at them. Be happy. Hey, how you been? How are the kids doing? Oh, everything's, being, everything's going well with you? Oh, it's good seeing you. I, will I can't tell you how many people I have just simply smiled at in church or in a store who the next week, they're back on my schedule. So, so it's, you know, and, and, you know, it's, again, it's easy to try to hold a grudge. Just don't do it, okay? Be above it all. Be friendly. Be courteous. Simple manners. And, and uh, leave the door open. If they go, oh, Doc, we miss you so much. Hey, love to have you back. Don't be pushy. Love to have you back. You'll be amazed at how many of them actually take you up on that offer. Uh, so in summary, the best advertising is you. You are the best advertising. Um, your patients need you to be the best doctor that you can be. Direct, in an insurance model, you have to work against the system to be good. Direct primary care is a system that facilitates you being a great doctor. Your colleagues need you to be ambassadors for this movement, to move it away from the fringe and into the mainstream. And as goofy as it sounds, your country needs you to be part of what's curing the healthcare system and, and, instead of the broken system that we currently have. And I'd like to end with the brilliant words of a fantastic philosopher who said, we need to approach this day with an enthusiasm unknown <laughs> to mankind. God bless America. There must be plenty of people who have questions, and we'll, we'll take them one at a time. My name is Darshan Kapadia, internal medicine, 26 what? years in private practice in Plano, Texas. And I'm a huge, huge proponent of this business model. Uh, my question to the panel is this. How do you um, convince patients to pay a membership fee versus a cash pay-as-you-go type scenario? Are mics on here? Can you hear me? No? And I have one other quick question on, 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 in addition to that. And, Work now. And that is, um, okay. what, what is your thought on charging a small admin fee $25, $30 a month, continuing to bill insurance, but to offset all of the unreimbursed services that we currently offer our patients. Okay, so the first question was, why, why would a patient choose a, a membership fee over uh, just a cash fee for service? Um, well, I, I would tell my patients, do you, want, uh, do you want a doctor for office visits or do you want a doctor all the time? Um, and, and I think that's, that's a, a game changer. Um, you could certainly set up a practice like that. There's been doctors who've done that for hundreds of years who, who have done a fee-for-service. Um, I, I couldn't do what I do if I did that. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to, to respond to several patients here in the last 20 minutes on email. Um, so, yeah, I think I, that's how I would sell. And some people would reject that idea, and that's okay. Um, and then the second question is basically you're ask, asking if, like, a concierge light. Um, one medical uh, does pretty much what you're describing. Um, but again, I think the, the administrative burden of billing insurance and the documentation and all that stuff is still going to exist. Um, you're not going to get away from that, and it's, it's going to still be distracting. Plus, I'd say it's the math. Um, to have 600 people paying you all the time uh, is, is just mathematically uh, a better outcome than waiting for a patient to come in and be sick and have a need and then bill every transaction and figure out how do we bill texts or emails or phone calls and when is it a new problem or just a follow-up to a problem. We're trying to simplify the process, not um, uh, make it complex again. 
one of my, if I can add something to that too, because um, that's obviously from our vantage point why that's a good idea, but from a patient vantage point, you have to think about how it corrupts how we practice medicine, the essentially a fee-for-service model, meaning that the only way we get paid is if you're with here, so that creates the artificial pressure that you have to draw people into the office to get paid for the care. So I tell people, listen, if you have something that can be managed and you can stay at work or you can, you can be with your kids. Again, opportunity cost, a stress opportunity cost. Um, you, you know, you have, you, your, your time is valuable. In fact, if you've got a week left to live, the one thing you learn is that time is the most valuable thing that you have. Um, we need to recognize that at all stages, so we respect your time. We, you have already compensated us. So we don't care, as long as it's medically appropriate, we're not gonna do malpractice, but we don't care. If, we can, if you can access us through technology, wonderful, it's convenient for you. It's going to be uh, effective for us, too. So I'm more go with them all. I, I would disagree with all of that because <laughs> no one this funny wears a suit. Yeah. So, so what, what he's hiding, I haven't figured out yet. But, but Lee wears a suit because he's respectable. Um, but clearly, with all those jokes, yeah, the suit is trying to hide something. And, and until we know what that is, um, we should be on our guard. Yeah. Uh -huh. He's right, more like uh, Ryan and I. He should dress like Ryan and I. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's break well, this up, boys. If my plane didn't arrive on time, I would have. <laughs> let's, let's go to this microphone right here. Hi, my name is uh, Manvinder Kainth. I'm a family medicine doc here in Irving. Uh, so my question is, there was a lot of um, talk a little bit about medications and dispensing medications, and then there was um, a blurb of not here in Texas. Uh, could somebody expand on that? Because I would love to be able to tell my patients, you don't have to now go to your pharmacy and wait for the pharmacist to have your prescription ready, which I could literally just hand you for... 20 cents, you know, like it's, it doesn't cost a thing. Um, so could um, somebody comment on that? For, uh, Josh, you probably remember, 42 states have absolutely no restrictions yep. on physician dispensing. Um, eight states have some restrictions. I believe four, it's almost, and Texas is one of them. It's, you just can't do it. Yeah. Um, it, you just can't uh, dispense and sell medications out of your office. This I man may know something about so it. So e even if it's free? Ooh, I, oh. I don't know about that. Like, can I literally just I, I don't know about that. hand it to them? <laughs> you got that? Okay. You'd have to be right. careful about the expectation, though. James yeah, I mean, Pinkney. Setting, setting that boundary would be very difficult because, I mean, what meds From are you going to How about my Humira? So, so yeah. all, all, maybe the ones on the $4 plan? I, you know? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Phil Eskew. Uh, I, I have an answer for you. Yeah. James Pinkney, Diamond Physicians yeah. here in uh, Dallas, Texas. We have three locations. So you can dispense in Texas. You just cannot make a profit. So you have to be very careful with your books. Thank you. That, that's, that's new. That's awesome if it's, if it, yeah, and, and we can probably find out more about yeah. that. But in general, I'd also say just like figure it out in the sense that um, how do we, we make it work for us? Innovators in, in every other field do this and push that envelope. Um, the, the state requirement in Texas, like most states, is to be a pharmacy tech is a high school equivalent degree and 120 hours of on-the-job training. So uh, become a farm tech. You're still dress And then nicer. you can dispense meds. You <laughs> know what? <true>. Yeah. <laughs> See, I know I didn't trust you. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, there, where there's a will, there's a way, and we can push, and there's great doctors. Um, uh, I know in Texas working on that legislation as well. So we, I think we just need to band together and part, doctors didn't know it was an option for so long or how meaningful it was to patients that it wasn't a hot topic for us. But if we push back, I think it could get reversed. And this is one of the things that Docs for Patient Care stands for, helping physician advocacy around the country, trying to put doctors together to go to state legislatures and, uh, and lobby for the, the things that are necessary to protect doctors who want to go into these practices, either protect direct primary care or, or dispensing uh, medications, et cetera. Let's go to that microphone. I'm Ann Jeffords from Salt Lake City. Um, I do internal medicine and pulmonary. So I, Utah is not allowed to dispense medication by law, period. So is there a place like I've heard that like there's a Macy's in South Carolina that does mail all the medications to the patient, patients at wholesale prices. Does anybody utilize that type of service? 
Well, I, I live in Kansas, so I don't have to do that. But I know there are some other, uh, you know, other opportunities for, for more transparent pricing. But I would say the bigger part is that you know, I can't sell all generic meds, and I can't make all meds pennies like these stories we share. But, but I think the other part is that we have the time to stop and think about what our patients' costs are. So there's some things I can't, I, I don't ha I can't stock 400 medicines in my clinic. Um, so even if I have to send a patient elsewhere, um, I research the best option for them and make sure that they are getting the best deal. And that might be using something like GoodRx, uh, a service you guys may be aware of. It may be a mail order. Um, it may be a patient assistance program. Um, and I think that that is, that is the real, uh, yeah, it's nice to be able to sell meds super cheap to people, but also just the, the thought process of, of, of doing no financial harm uh, is possible. So and it's not you, a deal breaker. Yeah. Is what you I do your say, labs but. in your office? Yeah, I think, yeah. We draw them in the office. And contract them to with like LabCorp? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of the nation, national companies will do and that. And what about your vaccinations? Like Pneumovax. Uh, vaccinations for yeah. kids. Vaccinations for kids are tricky because of our low volume, um, and and they're pretty expensive. So yeah. in my office, I do influenza and Tdap, and uh, otherwise, if people have insurance, um, they can bill their insurance. So what we found is it's much easier and cheaper for them to go either to a retail pharmacy if they're an adult or health department if they're a child. Um, so that that's just what works for us. But yeah, some vaccines are tricky because they're really expensive. You, you can't just bill insurance for the vaccines and not contract for everything else. So. Um, we, we just figure out how to, how to make things work. I, I've never had a situation where I couldn't get a patient a vaccine that they needed. Uh, I had one situation, and this is the, the frustrating thing about pharmacies and stuff, is they're, they're, again, not looking to add value to the patient. That's why we need that extra time. I had a patient getting chemotherapy for her MS, but she was like 36, and Walgreens doesn't have a policy for giving 36-year-old, or procedure 36-year-olds the um, uh, shingles vaccination because of everything she was getting, she had to get. So it's just bizarre how the system fails people, and, and, and we have to be, you know, we need the time to look for those solutions and, and research those. That's the, the good medicine side that I think often it doesn't get mentioned. Yeah, I'd say uh, that was a fantastic question. Um, unfortunately, I think we've got a lot of pediatricians here. My wife's a pediatrician, and that's one of the biggest limitations from them being able to jump full, fully into the direct primary care model. Um, so I say this, there are legislative types who are here today. Help us with that. Mike. Hi, Mike Strickland, direct primary care internist from Cincinnati. I adopted Josh's Atlas MD model in January 2015. Um, quick comment, and then I'll, I have a question. But uh, uh, you know, Josh's model is $300 a month, credit card on file, no sign-up fee, uh, no contract. The patient thing is the same way for the patient. So, well, you med students, and uh, you know, if you think it's too expensive to start your own practice. It's, it's easy to do that, get a little uh, moonlighting going and, and you're off and running. Um, to the gentleman who asked about uh, fee for service, page time you come, I do offer that. Uh, my goal is to build a full practice of monthly patients, but in the meantime, uh, I charge the same price. If people just want to come one time, I charge the same price as I would for a monthly thing. And it's just considered an urgent care visit and they're not a, a patient of my practice. Uh, my question is, um, uh, these true catastrophic high deductible uh, plans, uh, health insurance, what's the difference between that and an Obamacare insurance that's a $6,000, $10,000 deductible or regular insurance? I, so your question is, is what's the difference between when people use that term? Well, I mean, that's not a technical. I mean, you say catastrophic. I mean, that's not the technical details of an insurance plan. So I, I, as far as I know, there, most individuals don't have access to what I would consider a catastrophic individual policy. I mean, they're not available. There are some kind of non-ACA approved. Yeah, so if you work with employers, it changes everything because you can start getting very creative in, in the benefits and, and, and meeting the ACA requirements. For individuals, it gets a lot trickier. Um, because basically you have to buy a stock policy that meets ACA requirements. So there, there might be insurance products that yeah. do that. So that we're going to have purpose. a we're going to have a panel a little yeah. later on deal, on, on interacting with businesses and self-funded plans. Yeah. Uh, the details because that can sometimes get in the weeds. But you know a true catastrophic insurance plan that just covers nothing but you know hospitalizations, major medical. Uh, those plans technically are not legal under the Affordable Care Act, so it's hard to find them. Uh, there is a section in the Affordable Care Act, Section 1301A3, uh, that allows a wraparound insurance policy with direct primary care to meet the minimum essential coverage provisions, but to my knowledge, the Secretary of Health and Human Services has yet to write the rules on that. 
Um, and so we don't know what exactly that means or what that looks like. Now, anyone can go to United Healthcare's website and buy a $10,000 catastrophic health insurance policy. Uh, they are available, uh, and they're pretty reasonably priced, but you have to renew them every year, and technically they don't meet the minimum essential coverage provisions. Now, if you have an accountant that feels comfortable th with the fact that you have a catastrophic policy in direct primary care and the law legislation clearly says that's minimum essential coverage, if they feel comfortable s verifying that, but the IRS has definitely not weighed in on, on that one. Uh, but the, the ACA bronze plans, which are catastrophic plans, <laughs> are very heavily weighted with first dollar coverage for mandated services like everything that's A and B rated for US Preventive Services Task Force has to be in there with, with zero coverage. A true catastrophic plan doesn't have to cover that. It has to include maternity services and domestic violence counseling and all those things with, with zero dollar out of pocket. I mean, those are all important things to have access to, but that's the difference between the cost of, of a very expensive ACA compliant plan and a true catastrophic safety net. One of the things, I agree with the speaker who mentioned the health share plans. They're a great match with DPC, great for major medical. Um, and one last thing, I was in the black with my practice before I hit 100 patients. And I had had a, a private practice before. I had been closed five years. I had tried employed positions. So I was starting from scratch. I would guess 1,000 patients under the standard third-party system before you're in the black. Thank you, Mike. Let's go uh, over here. Real quick comment on the medicine. You are? Oh, I'm Mandy, and I'm a primary care doctor. I'd rather not say where I'm from. Um, wow. Because <laughs> I have a question about my employer. But um, about the medicines, um, a lot of these big companies give copay cards for SGLT2s, a lot of these diabetic meds for free. Mm -hmm. And some of these cash pay um, patients, I know one ARB chlorothaladone combo, which is a very good medicine that's very expensive, they are partnering with these specialty pharmacies and they can, for cash, $25. So yep. there's a lot of other ways to get brand name medicines very, very cheap too. Yep. Uh, my, my nurse and I joke that we're the best social workers in town. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's totally true. I mean, we have patients who are discharged from the hospital who are uninsured and, and you know, they had a social worker and this is, you know, I, I don't necessarily fault them, but for whatever reason, they weren't able to get our patients what they needed. And, you know, it's me and an RN. I, I don't have anyone special, any training, and we know the resources well enough, and, and you have to have both the clinical knowledge of, of what's best for the patient and awareness of what resources are available, whereas a social worker doesn't have that. I think what happens is, you know, this, the, the doctor prescribes something to the patient, the patient's uninsured, and the social worker says, well, there's no option to get that medicine. Now, if, if you had both the clinical knowledge and the uh, social work knowledge, like, oh, okay, well, this would be another option that may work for them. So, um, you know, I think it's a perfect uh, uh, arrangement, even for uninsured people, right. because I can, I can uh, uh, advocate for them. Sure. And three uh, quick questions. Okay. If you're employed, how do you start talking about this with your patient? I mean, is there any legal ramifications of starting to get them on board? Uh, and one more so. thing. Do, yeah. you, do you plan on, uh, should I, if I did this, go talk to and contract with the docs that were from my former employer? Well, again, that's, we're going to have a panel on the legal ramifications, so maybe that's a question okay. that's, that's best uh, um, put off until, until we get to that panel. If I can just say quickly, I, I'm the only one, and actually I was in exactly that situation. So sadly, it depends a lot on your contracts and your relationship with your local hospital or whoever your employer is. Okay. Let's go over here. Hi, I'm Elaine Reinhardt. I'm coming from Mississippi. I'm transitioning to this practice from 15 years in the emergency room. Um, my question is, one of the most difficult things we're trying to figure out in getting this set up is, how did you figure out what to charge them for the monthly fee so that you could actually not sink and have a practice? Um, I, for, for me, I think the best way to do it is what they call cost-based pricing to put it into some sort of objective reality, not just what you think you're worth, because we're bad at that, uh, and you can't compare apples to oranges. So what we did is we said, well, what do we want to make? What's our overhead? That's how much we need to make for the year. Divide that by 12 to find out how much we need to make for the month, and divide that by how many patients we think we can see. So it was, well, the average in our area was 150. We wanted it, the model to be better than that, so we said 200. We estimated overhead 120, 130, and then rounded up. That got to 360 per year. Uh, divided by 12 is, is 30,000 a month. And at the, at the time, it was just this idea that concierge doctors took between 400 and 600 patients. So then we got to $50 per patient per month. 
averaged out. But then I, the, the caveat to that, I say, is make sure the price matches the value. And, and you know, I will beat that value drum all day long because um, Lee paid me to. No. <laughs> he paid me for other stuff. No. Uh, he didn't pay me. Um, so is, is, uh, the kids are $10 because, and that's, that's probably on the way low end, uh, uh, admittedly, but they don't need daily meds or, or monthly labs often, and so you're not saving them as much, so you can't charge as much. But older adults, just looking at the math, is, oh yeah, you're gonna need more, and we can do more and save you more, so it justified a higher uh, age-based price. So, uh, absolutely. so Josh, I have a, a follow-up to let that. Let me follow up something real quick on that, because there are a lot of pediatricians in the office, and, and, and they're not gonna make it on $10 a month. Um, Right, different math for, for different situations, and you know, especially you know, in those first couple of years of life when those kids are coming in all the time for, for well checks, uh, it's important to set your prices accordingly, but I think the pediatricians you know, have a challenge on setting that price, but it's definitely not gonna be, the, the reason I can charge $10 a month for a child is because I charge you know, $50 a month for an adult. Yeah, utilization's actually a U-shaped curve. It's highest right. in the first couple of years, drops down, then it goes back up. Josh, um, so, then, so then geography, it plays plays a role in your pricing. Absolutely, yep. And, and you know that and that's where you have to know your market. Um, someone else was saying they were going to um, require a six month upfront payment. And I was like, whoa, I do not recommend that. I'm like, oh no, we're a main country and people only work six months out of the year. So if you don't get your money now, you you won't get it. It's like, okay, you know, if all politics is local, all healthcare is even more local. So you still have to know your market, your value, but if you're not doing meds, you're not doing wholesale labs, and you're charging a copay, you better not charge a higher membership fee. You know, you, you can't make it harder on the patients and expect faster success. Um, but it really depends on, on what your goal is. Everybody's goal is different. Some want to work full-time, part-time, some want to, want to make 300,000 a year, some just want to make 100,000 a year, and, and you would adjust that math accordingly. Yeah, I, I would echo what Josh says. Don't, don't just pick a random number out of the sky. And, and unfortunately, I've seen a lot of people do that. They look around and see what other people are charging. And they think, well, I'm, I'm a little bit older and more experienced, so I'm going to charge a double. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so start with what your costs are. It's, it's really simple math. Figure out what your business operating costs will be, what your staff will be, what your lease rate will be, and then have an idea of what you think you want to take home and, and just do the, the reverse equation. It's, it's really not that complicated. Just a quick follow-up on that about Josh's comment about know the local environment. Um, we're in Michigan, we have what we call snowbirds, so a lot of people who spend their winters in Florida. So we have a hash, half price uh, discount for the months that they're not in the state. And this helps them because they say, well, can I just be a member in the summer and, and drop? But I say, well, they still do telemedicine, we're still following you and such. But that's a way that, that's just unique to our geographic area. So you may have something similar like that. And the beauty of this model, yeah, college students, something of that sort. The beauty of this model is you can do whatever you want, you know? <laughs> The downside to this model Almost. is you can do whatever you want. <laughs> I, it, it gets people in trouble, and it's like, you know, where are my options? I have no, no boundaries, no borders, and, and if you've seen one DPC practice, you've seen one DPC practice. So it does get hard to, you know, um, know what you can and can't do sometimes. Rebecca Bernard, Family Medicine, Fort Myers, Florida. Um, I live in a part of the country that has the highest concentration of concierge practices in the U.S. So whenever I talk about my practice, I go, oh, concierge. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you suggest we do to distinguish ourselves from a concierge practice and a, as a selling point? Well, charge a lot less to start. Um, I, I, it's funny because in, when I started my practice, I, uh, uh, I was so fearful of getting that label um, that I did everything in my power. I'm in, in a university town, and I, I think if I would have gotten that, um, uh, that label, it, it probably wouldn't have been very helpful, and it would have been very, um, you know, it would turn very political quickly. So I, I tried everything to avoid that label, um, but, but I, I mean, I, I think it's okay that people think that you're concierge and providing a higher level of service, um, but explain to them, you know, if they're a patient, explain to them that it's a lot more affordable and actually better because they're not still billing insurance. I don't know if most of the, the practices you know, they still bill insurance, oh, they yeah. still have the normal, you know, rigmarole and copays and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it's a totally different uh, uh, model, um, but it, yeah, it can be difficult to distinguish. Some don't like the term, but um, blue collar concierge is another one. Uh, John Isbicki, if he's here, he was, yep, was it cover of U.S. News and World Report? Um, yeah, up, up in um, Pennsylvania, had a brain fart. Um, uh, so th that can help, or the affordable version. Uh, we were interviewed by Bloomberg Business uh, Weekly in 2012, and they asked why say concierge if it's not that concierge. 
And we said, because we want to, we, we've devalued family medicine to, in patients' eyes because we haven't been valuable to them. And concierge helps bring that up as something unique and interesting at that time because it was still the direct care buzzword hadn't been invented by Ryan, Dr. Ryan Newhoffel yet. Um, <laughs> and so uh, some of you might know him. Um, and uh, it, so we said, but eventually we want to drop that because family medicine, it, it concierge family medicine is redundant. It's, it's family medicine becomes a brand of, of itself that is, oh, I want somebody who's doing this high value care. So it, it's kind of an evolution in marketing more than I would say business model. I sometimes. think the quick way of describing it is that they're actually the antithesis of each other in reality. They're both trying to give great care. I, re I respect that. Concierge charges more to give you great care. Direct primary care cuts out the bureaucracy to give you great care. So we do it at the opposite end, uh, end points of the price spectrum, even though actually the doctor comes out pretty close to the same. Yeah. Right over here. Hi, my name is Sasha No. I'm running a family medicine practice in Apollo Beach, Florida right outside of Tampa. I started the practice right out when I got out of residency, so it's really encouraging to me to hear you guys talk. Um, I feel like I'm part of your tribe. I'm sitting here going, yes! <laughs> this is exactly how I feel. Um, and so it's been four years in the practice and it's really going well, partly because I was trained um, and I really gravitated towards more of a Medicare managed care model, uh, capitation with risk. And so that's very uh, central to my practice where it's really, it's going very well. But the concept behind that, where you take care of fewer patients, providing great care and doing well, is to me the common uh, part of direct primary care that really appeals to me. My question is, does anyone here have that sort of combination? I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand. What kind of combination? Of hybrid. You the have combination a hybrid of practice? a. Well, I'm asking whether someone has a direct primary care arm with a Medicare mm -hmm. Advantage capitation risk model. So, I'm probably the only one up here that that does anything similar to that. Now, I I stopped taking Medicare Ad Advantage plans in 2004 because, quite frankly, I hate them. Okay. Uh, but I but I. Yeah, I, I, I really hate them. Um, it, it's, it's all, it, it, in, in my experience, it was the, the worst part about dealing with commercial health, commercial health insur insurance at the Medicare fee schedule. Uh, so it was the, the worst of both worlds from, from my perspective. Uh, we had a full practice, and what we did was we started to cancel our insurance contracts as the insurance companies did stupid stuff. Uh, and so we started off by signing up our, our uninsured patients. That was low-hanging fruit. Uh, pretty easy to capture the folks that have high deductible health plans because once they go to the checkout and they see the bill, they say, oh, have you heard about our direct primary care program? Uh, but then when United Healthcare implements the lab benefits management program where we have to prior authorize PAPs and blood tests, uh, we can send a nice discharge notice to, to United Healthcare. So we have since terminated our contracts with United Healthcare, with Cigna, with Aetna, and Humana. Uh, so we're essentially Medicare only over the age of 65 billing fee for service Medicare, not billing any membership fee whatsoever to our Medicare eligible patients, membership only below the age of 65. So I have to say that your sentiments about Medicare Advantage plans are essentially what probably the masses are about potential for direct primary care as far as my experience because I've actually found it to be the best way for me to take care of my patients, control those costs, not contributing to the problems that we have in this country, but also having super healthy patients. And so the way that I approach that is, you know, the goal here is to keep you healthy. And then actually, as it turns out, that's good for me as well. So I was trained by really phenomenal physicians of high integrity, great physicians, to be able to make this work. So it's actually, it's kind of interesting because your perception actually does tend to be what most people think about it, but when it's done well, to me, it is an arm of, you know, similar concept where we see fewer patients and we provide great care and those patients are contacting me, you know, those sorts of things. So um, I guess, you know, for me, is there anyone in the room that is looking to do something like that that I maybe be able to put heads together with, or am I alone in this in 250-something room? <laughs> well, I, I can go. say there are models out there like yours. Um, in fact, um, there are some of the larger DPC organizations who um, do contract, um, like Iora Health um, actually contracts directly with uh, Medicare Advantage uh, payers, um, and they pay a capitated rate uh, supposedly with minimal administrative and, and paperwork burden. So I know that that has played out for some people, but um, mm -hmm. 
I guess it just depends on the, on the, the requirements of the plan and what they pay you ultimately. I mean, I, I would love it if third parties would, would pay me a, a fixed fee without a lot of headaches and hassle. I mean, I, I haven't seen that opportunity uh, uh, from, from third parties except for maybe employers. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think every practice is gonna be unique right. and if that works for you. And that only works for risk. But the question that I have for you then um, regarding uh, how long does it take to ramp up a direct primary care? Because I look as I look ahead, you know, I'm planning for 2019, just trying to make these adjustments. How long does it take you to get up to that f f four to 600 patients? I, it, it depends. I know doctors who had 300 patients enrolled on day one of their practice, and I know doctors who are in year four and have 300 patients. Okay. So it depends on so many factors. And I, I always tell people, like, I cannot give you an exact number of how many patients you'll have at 12 months because I've seen it all at this point. I've seen people full in six months, and I see people, I've seen people at three years who aren't even half full. So. And, and some of that just depends on your location, your model, your pricing, your value, um, your marketing. I mean, it, it, and, you know, <clears throat> Chad... It pains me to say, because um, uh, is a hundred percent right there. I mean, it is it is pound the pavement, do the stuff, and and the more. You, you find you want me to take the tie off. I do. I do. No, I feel so much better. Um, I have. A, <laughs> it is uh, uh, the best marketing is a good business model, and and that really will determine um, how fast you grow in a lot of ways. So, but. And will yeah. we be getting into the best way to identify where we are if our demographics fit well for a model like this? Probably Here. in the breakout sessions tomorrow. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mike Eigerbrecht. I am from Southwest Michigan. I've been in practice for 23 years, and, and I'm part of a, a four-physician group. We're independent, and we're one of the few independent practices in Southwest Michigan. Uh, we're looking at making this transition next October, and I guess I'm looking for advice on transitioning a practice to this model. Maybe Lee and Chad, you've done that, and what's worked well, and what advice would you give to our practice? Um, well, first of all, since you are from Michigan, I'd say support those who have supported you. Um, we've got, uh, you know, this is not trying to be too political, but Senator Colbeck is the whole reason we can do that in the state of Michigan. And there's something called Fixing Michigan, where we're actually going around and trying to educate people. So come and join us. Come and join us. <coughs> Go around Free Market Medical Association and other organizations are trying to get the word out. Specific budget. You know, there are going to be lean times in the early phase. You've got to budget to get through that. Again, kind of going back to the whole marketing thing, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. Try to do a lot of educating before the switch. Give people heads up. Again, concierge is different, but there was a group near us that went concierge. They notified everybody through a letter on a weekend that basically the next Monday they weren't a patient anymore unless they paid a bunch of money. That's That's extortion basically so I I, uh, I gave them no notice and I came no I know I tried to give them at least six months notice and I that gave me an opportunity to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations again get that personal relationship initially they're not gonna buy into the model initially you're gonna have to get word of mouth out there and people actually seeing that it really works people think it's a scam the prices are so good they go, that's ah, a scam I tell them no 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 the current system is the scam <laughs> just everybody's going going along with it um, uh, so it's actually a fairly complex question. I'd be thrilled to talk to you on the side if you, okay, if you want. Thank you. And, and just to, to give Senator Colbeck his due, um, I think we all owe him a, a debt of gratitude in a lot of ways because he was one of the originals who started and the, got Michigan to pass that legislation that was insurance free. Phil probably knows for sure which one was, was first, but and then continued to, to beat that drum and then other states followed. It's amazing how much of that initial momentum is so hard to get going, but once you do, Several other states wanted to do it just because Michigan had done it, and it's budget neutral, and it's easy to do, and it's it's really not a political thing, so it gets traction pretty quick. Um, and and yeah, so that that support being in your home state is huge. Yeah. Uh, and it may seem weird if you're in a different state to say, why should I care what's occurring in, in, in Michigan? But just like Josh mentioned, what occurs in one state, irrespective of which state that is, can influence the policymakers. It's the laboratory of democracy, right, each of the states. See? And they all kind of steal from each other in a good way to improve their own uh, situation. So get in behind those, those legislators who are supportive of our cause, irrespective of what state they're in, because that actually may spiral into helping your own situation. And then in terms of transition, um, uh, Dr. Madison in Ohio is just a good example I can think of. Um, took uh, six or eight weeks and had a, a flyer and had their prices for everything and then blanks for everything else. And they, 
I mean, just well-trained staff in the sense of we're committed to this transition, everybody's on the same page, we're marketing the same stuff, and every patient that was seen for you know, six, eight weeks left with that thing filled out by the doctor or the staff. So when you got to the bottom, if the right column was higher than the left column, then you should join. And, and they had over 300 convert, so that, of course that's always easiest, but, and then they did put a firm date, but everybody who came through knew what was going on and saw objective reasons why it was better. So it's show and tell, like, like Chad said. Thank you. Over here. I, <coughs> hi, I'm Dan Einstein. I'm a family doc in Denver, Scott, Maine, and uh, we're going to be switching over to DPC in the first of the year. Um, my question for you guys is, do any of you guys um, give patients super bills um, to submit themselves to insurance uh, as a way of trying to offset um, you, you, the membership costs that they have to pay? Uh, I, I, I don't. Um, I don't. And I could be yeah. very, this is, gets real technical really quickly. Um, I, I think if, there are docs who do that. You have to be very, very careful in how you do that and, and what you're giving them. Um, now, you can certainly give receipts. I give receipts for everything I ever charge. Uh, but when you say a super bill, what you're talking about usually is, is, is CPT codes with associated charges. Right, exactly. So unless you're actually doing CPT codes and associating charges with them, it gets kind of tricky to do that. Yeah, you really want to be careful. I mean, if you're giving them a receipt saying that you provided, you know, $123 worth of 99213 level services and you didn't actually collect that money from them, you're, you could be com committing insurance fraud. So you really got to be careful with that. Uh, the only time we actually do anything in terms of, of invoicing, uh, some benefits plans now will not They'll, they'll give the patient a discount on their insurance if they have a physical, but they won't count a physical as an office note. Uh, they won't accept a, a prescription. They won't accept a signed form that says you had a physical. It has to be a valid claim to the insurance company for a physical. Um, so we submit a bill for a penny uh, for our physicals <laughs> so the patients get credit for that. I know. And then we mess with their accounting. <laughs> Normally I say... Um, uh, undersell and over deliver, but when it comes to that question, uh, I undersell and under deliver. Uh, <laughs> be because it, if it was easy to get paid by insurance, none of us would be at this conference. And, and we're better at it in theory than the patients are. And, and, and that's where the, the, we've seen docs oversell and under deliver there by saying, oh, yeah. My fee is $75, but I was hoping that you'd get $25, $35, $50 dollars back each time you submit something. So really, it's only a few hundred dollars a, a, a year. Uh, and then, of course, it's next to impossible to get paid by insurance, and, and the patients struggle with that. And insurance is always going to leverage that bureaucracy against yep. the patient and the doctor. Yeah, and, and now the ball's in your court, and you're easier to get a hold of than the insurance. So the insurance says your doctor didn't fill your paperwork out correctly. So you need to have your doctor redo. Well, I, I'm not trying to do work two, three times, it, one and done. So it, it's one of those where if I had to, I'd print it off as part of a record, stamp not a bill on there, something, you know, I agree with everything Lee said, but, but don't expect to get paid. One, if you do, wow, let me know. <laughs> but I, I don't think, because yeah, it just, the chances are, are, aren't that good. One slight deviation from your question, if, if you have a pharmacy in your, and, or you're doing the labs and things of that sort, and the person is an HSA, that's a, a situation where the receipt is a really good idea because, they, I mean, again, you're functioning as a pharmacy in that situation. That should be something that could be coverable under their HSA, but not your fee specifically. But yeah, it's not an insurance claim. This yeah. Next. <coughs> Hello, my name is Kawa Chalupa. I'm a current osteopathic medical student from Ohio University. And I was wondering, um, just like going to residency, have any of you gone from residency directly into this program, and then what does that look like exactly? Because it sounds kind of like... <clears throat> yeah, Josh and I, I both did. Um, I started about my practice about six months after graduating, moonlighted in the interim to save up some capital. Um, it, it's, it's, in some ways, much more challenging, uh, if you're, especially you're in a community where you have no reputation. So you're battling both trying to get a professional reputation and then you know, uh, still trying to explain the model. So, I mean, it, there's more hurdles to clear, uh, but at the same time, it gives you the opportunity to start with a fresh, uh, clean slate. Uh, you don't have to worry about some of the backlash of, of why you're abandoning your patients, and, and we all kind of know that's a silly uh, label, but um, when you start fresh, you don't have to do that. You know, you can say, this is, this is me. I've never practiced in any other way. Um, so it gives you an incredible opportunity, but I would say you have to, you have to network even extra hard because no one is probably going to know who you are. But neither one of us are wearing suits, so there must be a connection. <laughs> I don't know if, up I don't know that, if it's an affordability <laughs> thing or, yeah. Um, 
I, I would, yeah, obviously we think it's a good idea, but, um, you know, we, that's where we were in our career versus um, Leah and, and Chad. Uh, but it, it, everything has its pros and cons. The, the, the benefit to being right at a residency is you don't need a huge income. Uh, like Lee said, you know, they had mortgages and kids in school and, and own a building. It's hard at that point to, to make the direct switch. So it wouldn't be always a smart thing to do. But when you're uh, fresh out of, out of training, yeah, poor resident, <laughs> Um, you, it, it is easier, and you can moonlight, and you don't have as much debt. So now you be in the black in 100 patients, depending on what you do. And what I think we'll see is even more doctors hiring. And as they come out, the option is, all right, do I jump into a practice that I can look at that's got a track record, et cetera? We just hired our first DO a week ago Monday, um, uh, he, fresh out of uh, training. And he took a couple months off and wanted to start in October, so it worked perfect. Uh, there'll be a lot of those options, mm -hmm. but it gets easier all the time because now almost, you know, literally by the month, you have more examples of doctors who are doing it successfully to look at and see, okay, how did they do it? What do I like? What do I want to take from that? And then over the next few years, build that to, to start your own. Yeah. One um, quick addition to that, actually do, converting from insurance and sometimes actually harder because you basically design your life for your income. And, and, you know, it takes, you basically got golden handcuffs, right? So you're actually making a good living and you're putting that at risk and you got a mortgage and you got a family and that's actually, that's kind of a hard thing to do. Um, so sometimes it's actually harder to make that conversion, even though you may have some patient base that comes with you immediately. Uh, in regard to, to reputation, that can be a blessing or a curse. If you, you know, if you have a, you know, if you're, the people in Josh's community knew him, no one would have ever signed up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's I, I would, let's be, I would also. It. I would also like to note between Josh and I, um, I think we have like 17 children combined between the two of us, and that's why we have to dress like this. We can't afford suits because we have so many children. So let's go to the next question. Thank you. <laughs> well, most of them are mine, of the 17. But <laughs> my name is Will Craighead. I'm actually originally from Arizona, but uh, I'm doing my rotations in South Georgia, so that's where I flew in from. Uh, I'm actually a PA student. I hope I don't get thrown out now. Um, <laughs> But I'm a huge fan of DPC, uh, wish I had known about it before I got into PA school. Um, my question is about the health sharing ministries, you know, the Christian healthcare ministries of which I am a member, pay like 45 bucks a month, and I never go to the doctor ever. Um, there's also Liberty Health, or Liberty Health Share, Liberty Direct, as was mentioned earlier. I don't know, I, I, you know people ask me about them, and I've gotten people to join them, but I, can you speak to the credibility, and do they pay for these <coughs> high, high deductible things that they are crediting to pay for? Well, I would say when I talk to my patients that um, I, I don't have a single insurance solution for all of them, um, and, and, and I, I am not them. So I, I, I have to uh, say that uh, uh, you know, every individual situation is unique and what the best insurance plan for them is going to be unique. Um, and and I, I do have to stop short of like giving some type of 100% you know, ring endorsement that this insurance plan or sharing ministry is going to be amazing. Um, because you don't want to be on the hook for anything that they may experience that didn't go well. Um, so yeah, I have patients who have all the above. Um, and, okay. and what I tell them is I, I'm willing to sit down and talk with them about like what their costs would be um, and, and, and give them a little bit of advice. But I'm not an insurance broker. I'm not a financial advisor. So one of the things that could be helpful is if you have someone in your community who I, I think financial advisors do a little bit better job, but a financial advisor, a broker who you can send patients to, I and mean, they'll be happy to, to take the, the patient's uh, business um, and sit down with them and make sure they understand your model and then give the patient's advice um, about what works best with the DPC plan they're okay. getting. Has so, anybody had experience with them, with these yeah. other ministries? If, if I can just say quickly, um, I actually use them uh, a lot. There are some limitations, okay? They're Christian-based. So they have moral exemptions. If you come in with pre-existing conditions, one of the reasons that they can be less expensive is because they actually can discriminate. I don't mean based on race or gender or something of that sort. They can say, insurance used to be able to discriminate. Used to be able to say you have pre-existing conditions. They can act like um, insurance now. Yeah, so they're essentially functioning as the old catastrophic insurances, um, but I would actually argue they're better than that. So if you have a boatload of pre-existings, they're probably not the best option for you, but if you're reasonably healthy, that is the time to sign up with them. Uh, they also have moral exemptions. So if you're going down and you're picking up, um, 
I don't know, lady of the night, if I can say that nicely, <laughs> and you contract something from that, they will say, ooh, that didn't adhere to our Christian ethos, so we're not going to cover that. So there are some exemptions. I'm also a member of one. I'm part of uh, Samaritan Ministries, and Liberty is great too, and there, there's MediShare and others. Um, so I like them. I think they're incredibly effective, but there are some restrictions. You do need to know them. I would argue the brokers are not a great place to go. They're financially incentivized to steer you away from those kind of things to their own products. So basically, you know, I don't trust Ryan. He's not wearing a suit. Guys, can we, can we, can we try if to you, get these last few questions if the, in? If the broker happens to be your patient, that helps. Yeah. Okay. That's the brokers I send my uh, patients go, to. Let's go to this microphone. Hi, I'm Farah Loki. I'm from Gilbert, Arizona. I'm a pediatrician. Pediatricians represent. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <Woo-hoo! laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was a couple of just some statements and a question. Yes, it cost me 100000 a year to, for vaccines, so um, I would like to get rid of that problem, but it's a little, it's a little difficult. Um, and a lot of my, in my area is very affluent, so a lot of people do not want to go to the, the um, county, mm-hmm. uh, even though it's really clean, and I've taken my own child there. No one wants <laughs> to believe me. So um, I'm trying my best to come up with some other solutions, and on the Facebook page there are some solutions, but it's, it seems like it may be a little bit difficult because that's one thing they don't like about the whole thought of DPC and not me me not offering vaccines in my office, which I would love not to do. Um, and also, Ryan, you said you uh, pr- trained in Arizona. I did my intern year in Arizona. You intern in Arizona. Arizona. So in Arizona, we don't wear suits; only those snobs at Mayo. So don't yeah. worry about dry yeah. dress. I didn't okay. go to Mayo. I, I'm not that smart. Yeah. I was I was Josh at the top of the bell curve, but I was just to the left actually. So yeah. I wasn't quite. And I went to U of A med school down in Tucson. It's like no shoes, no <laughs> shirt, no service down there. So, you know, it's, it's, anyway, anyway um, my question is I have a large population. I'm one of the few pediatricians in my area that take foster children. Um, so I take the foster children insurance, CMDP. And um, um, my question is you talk about Medicare, Medicare, Medicare. What about my Medicaid? I do have a lot of great. Um, foster kids on the Medica- those Medicaid mm-hmm. um, things, and I really love them, I really want to keep them, but I really like DPC, so how, is there, can I balance that? Is that, well, a, is that something I can a- do? Every state, you know, the Medicaid plans in every state, because they're state administered, are gonna be different. So some of them are going to be state run, some of them are gonna be private run, so yeah, I mean, it depends on a lot of details about what plans you're working with. Um, but if you, if you wanted to continue to build them, obviously you're going to be looking at, at, at doing whatever they require. Um, but yeah, that's more of a hybrid question. I don't think it's unique to Medicaid per se, but it depends on your state um, and what restrictions they may place on you. Yeah, and, and so one of the things, again, it's, it's state specific, but sometimes if you're doing a DPC and not billing Medicaid, if you're not a Medicaid provider, sometimes they won't fill your prescriptions. Um, they won't let you bill patients in some states. Uh, and Fortunately, in Florida, met the one part of Medicaid is a share of cost Medicaid, and it's a $500 deductible that resets every month. Uh, if somebody had $500 a month to spend for health care, they wouldn't need Medicaid. Um, but it's a perfect high deductible safety net, you know, if they need surgeries or something catastrophic. So it works really, really well with what we're doing. So those patients actually do seek us out. Twelve. Yeah. Um, hello, uh, Twyla Liberty Citizens Council for Health Freedom and the founder of the Wedge of Health Freedom. Uh, I just wanted everyone, for one thing, to just know is the whole idea of the wedge is to drive patients to you who are doing this type of practice and so that you get on our map of freedom. And then we have a wedge of freedom Wednesday health freedom minute on the radio, 800 stations around the country. Every Wednesday, wedge of freedom Wednesday, I say something. One of the things that I'm going to say is there was a doctor here who said that he just got two patients off the wedge two days ago. So this is what we want to have happen. And not just for freedom for you and your patients, but for the entire country. So um, the question that I have is, um, oh, and I just want to say about health sharing, our organization did an entire report on health sharing and compared three of the plans. It's a little bit old, but you can go and look at it and get an idea. And there's lots of stories and testimonials on all the health sharing organizations. Um, But the question I have is having to do with charity. So, uh, because I, I know that this is something that even I, with the Wedge of Health Freedom, will have to answer. So both for charity and for people who come to a DPC monthly payment clinic, I want to know how you deal with that. Somebody who just comes and they just want to get cared for, or, so that's one piece of it, they just want to pay you, right? But the other piece of it has to do with, do you provide any charity care? 
or are you completely only for those who come monthly? Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, medicine has always been a practice of charity and charitability. Uh, I just did an interview, Facebook Live, of an 82-year-old surgeon who said 25% of his patients before Medicaid did not pay him. So they arranged a $10 a month. He said it was more, it was more, uh, it costs more to try and get that $10 than to do it. But it was important because it wasn't actually charity. So I would just like you all to respond about those two things. Thank you. Well, I think the first thing, the first thing to say is the reason that people can't afford stuff is because it costs too dang much. Um, and, and so, you know, lo lowering our prices is helpful. But yes, there's, there's always going to be people who can't even afford a dollar a month. And I think we all have to recognize that. Um, I, I would say, uh, in my own personal experience, um, most of my patients are underserved. Um, 50 to 60% of my patients don't have insurance and they're, you know, lower income patients. That won't be true for all practices. So when I hear that criticism that I'm abandoning poor people, it's laughable to me personally because I know what I do every day. In fact, I wrote an article um, a, a few years ago, if you want to read about my story, called the Concier or Building a Concierge Safety Net Clinic, um, which was kind of tongue in cheek. So if you want to read my story and who my patients are, that's a pretty good place to start. I'd say case by case. I think we all decide to do charity on the, on the patient, the needs, the, the circumstances. Um, if a charity comes to us, your, your, your care goes further. This goes into my political talk to senators is, um, you know, however you pay for, for Medicaid, wouldn't you rather pay $2 for a CBC than 50? Because we can do, do that much more care. So um, it's a balancing act um, for each clinic to decide. Yeah. We're running out of time, so I'll just try to be quick. But it's actually easier to do charity under this model. Under the, in the insurance model, you can actually be in violation of your various insurance contracts, including Medicare, if you give charity. It's actually ridiculous. So I have one patient, just a quick example, who I charge her $100 for the year. I don't believe in get, doing it for free for anybody. If you value, if you price it at zero, they value it at zero. So charge something, but make it cheap, make it affordable. I have the ability to do that in this model. And we are treating hepatitis C in our practice for cheaper than the health department. <laughs> That's great. Last question. Hello, my name is Dan Schaefer, uh, and along with my wife and business partner, we opened a practice in, uh, in April in Durango, Colorado. It's called Whole Health Family Medicine Clinic. Lots of help from Atlas. I appreciate your help, Josh, in getting that going. Um, and my question's about marketing. Um, in developing our marketing plan and training our staff and how to you know, share our marketing plan, one of the challenges we've dealt with is that balance between you know, talking about you know, the dollar general approach, you know, that we're cheaper, um, and feeding off the negativity of, the, uh, of the, our you know, sort of, uh, uh, counterparts you know, that are insured, you know, as opposed to focusing on you know, our customer service and our relationships and our outcomes, which is harder to get that message across, right? You know, it's harder to really dig into that. Uh, but I'm thinking about identity of our practice, identity of DPC in general, and how, you know, if you guys have uh, found ways to bridge that gap and get to that other side of that coin. I, well, I think we're going to do a big talk on marketing later, but uh, I would put on a chicken suit and stand on the corner with one of those spinny signs, <laughs> and that, that's where I would start talking. Yeah, so we'll definitely get into, in, into some of the details <laughs> uh, uh, about that tomorrow. Um, one of the things I would encourage is when, once you make the contact with the patient, get him in the office. Just, just get them in. Don't send them off to the website. They've already called you. They, you know, all your marketing has worked. If they've picked up the phone and they've called you, your marketing has worked. They've reached out to you. They want to be patients there. Get them in the office. You'll, you'll sell them in the office. There's no question. And, and my thought would be steal. Uh, again, good artists borrow, great artists steal. And there's enough doctors doing this. You know, Ryan, um, Luke, who I think will, will be here later today, um, uh, other docs do an amazing job on the Facebook side. And it is free, and you can steal their ideas. Um, uh, one year we did $500 flu shot raffles, uh, so Ryan did 1,000. And it was just like, <laughs> boom. I mean, it was great. Well, we did two 500s, but, but so he did 1,000, but it's good A-B testing for us, too. What's better? What gets more people in the door? Two chances to win $500 or one chance to win 1,000. Um, and then we can all learn from that. So building that is, A, have a great model, but find the other great models similar to you and see what they're doing that is successful um, because then you don't have to uh, try and experiment. You, you're at least you know, bouncing off of something that you already know is successful. Well, I w I'd like to thank our panelists. Um, we're just a couple of minutes over, but um, they did a great job. Let's have a round of applause for them.